Guten Tag or in other words hello and I know it's been a while since I did a book thief reading but I figured hey I am bored and I have nothing else to do so let's get back into that. So today's book thief video reading, no cutting, I'm not gonna cut it at all, no editing whatsoever. I also don't have any makeup on, I look totally normal so for any of you if you prefer me with makeup, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just gonna read. Um, so I'll just start where I left off, I guess. All right. So the chapter uh, where I am at currently is growing up a Zaumensch. Oh, right. And I also am now going to do it in 15-minute increments, which will take a long time. But, um, so I will rename these videos 15 Minutes of the Book Thief. Yeah, I think that'll work. All right. Yes, an illustrious career. I should hasten to admit, however, that there was, an, that there was a considerable hiatus between the first stolen book and the second. Another noteworthy point is that the first was stolen from snow and the second from fire. Not to admit that others, not to omit, that others were also given to her. All told, she owned 14 books, but she saw her story as being made up predominantly of 10 of them. Of those 10, six were stolen, one showed up at the kitchen table, two were made for her by a hidden Jew, and one was delivered by a soft, yellow-dressed afternoon. When she came to write her story, she would wonder exactly when the books and the words started to mean not just something, but everything. Was it when she first set eyes on the room with shelves and shelves of them? Or when Max Vanden Vandenborg, or Vandenberg arrived on Himmel Street carrying handfuls of suffering in Hitler's Mein Kampf? Was it reading in the shelters, the last parade to Dachau? Was it the word shaker? Perhaps there would never be a precise answer as to when and where it occurred. In any case, that's getting ahead of myself. Before we take, before we make it to any of that, we first need to tour Lise Memminger's beginnings on Himmelsch Street and the art of Zalmenshing. Upon her, her arrival, arrival, good lord, I'm having issues today, you could still see the bite marks of snow on her hands and the frosty blood on her fingers. Everything about her was undernourished. Wire-like shins, coat hanger arms, she did not produce it easily, but when it came, she had a starving smile. Her hair was a close enough brand of German blonde, but she had dangerous eyes, dark brown. You didn't really want brown eyes in Germany around that time. Perhaps she received them from her father, but she had no way of knowing, as she couldn't remember him. There was really only one thing she knew about her father. It was a label she did not understand. A strange word. Kommunist. She had heard it several times in the past few years. Communist. There were boarding houses crammed with people, rooms filled with questions, and that word. That strange word was always there somewhere, standing in the corner, watching from the dark. It wore suits, uniforms. No matter where they went, there it was. Each time her father was mentioned. She could smell it and taste it. She just couldn't spell or understand it. When she asked her mother what it meant, she was told that it wasn't important that she shouldn't worry about such things. At one boarding house, there was a healthier woman who tried to teach the children to write using charcoal on the wall. Lise was tempted to ask her the meaning, but it never eventuated. That one day, that woman was taken away for questioning. She didn't come back. When Lise arrived in Molching, she had at least some inkling that she was being saved. But that was not a comfort. If her mother loved her, why leave her on someone else's doorstep? Why? 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 The fact that she knew the answer, if only at the most basic level, seemed beside the point. Her mother was constantly sick, and there was never any money to fix her. Lisa knew that. But that didn't mean she had to accept it. No matter how many times she was told that she was loved, there was no recognition that the proof was in the abandonment. Nothing changed the fact that she was a lost, skinny child in another foreign place with more foreign people. Alone. 
The Hubermans lived in one of the small box-like houses on Himmel Street. A few rooms, a kitchen, and a shared outhouse with neighbors. The roof was flat and there was a shallow basement for storage. It was supposedly not a basement of adequate depth. In 1939, this wasn't a problem. Later in 42 and 43 it was. When the air raid started, they always needed to rush down the street to a better shelter. In the beginning, it was the profanity that made an immediate impact. It was so vehement and prolific. Every second word was either Zaumensch or Zaukerl or Arschloch. For people who aren't familiar with these words, I should explain. Zau, of course, refers to pigs. In the case of Zaumensch, it serves to castigate, berate, or plain humiliate as a female. Zaukerl, pronounced Zaukerl, is for a male. Arschloch can be translated directly into asshole. That word, however, does not differentiate between the sexes. It simply is. Zaumensch du dreckiges! Lisa's foster mother shouted that, that first evening when she refused to have a bath. You filthy pig! Why won't you get undressed? She was good at being furious. In fact, you could say that Rosa Hubermann had a face decorated with constant fury. That was how the creases were made in the cardboard texture of her complexion. Lisa, naturally, was bathed in anxiety. There was no way she was getting into any bath, or into bed for that matter. She was twisted in, into one corner of the closet-like washroom, clutching for the non-existent arms of the wall for some level of support. There was nothing but dry paint, difficult breath, and the deluge of abuse from Rosa. Leave her alone, Hans Ubermann entered the fray. Leave her alone, Hans, Uber Hans Ubermann entered the fray. His gentle voice made its way in, as if slipping through a crowd. Leave her to me. He moved closer and sat on the floor against the wall. The tiles were cold and unkind. You know how to roll a cigarette? He asked her, and for the next hour or so, they sat in the rising pool of darkness, playing with the to tobacco and the cigarette papers and Hans Hubermann smoking them. When the hour was up, Lisa could roll a cigarette moderately well. She still didn't have a bath. Some facts about Hans Hubermann. He loved to smoke. The main thing he enjoyed about smoking was the rolling. He was a painter by trade and played the piano accordion. This came in handy, especially in winter, when he could make a little money playing in the pubs of Moiching, like the Knorra. He had already cheated me in one world war, but would later be put into another, as a perverse kind of reward, where he would somehow manage to avoid me again. To most people, Hans Hubermann was barely visible. An unspecial person. Certainly his painting skills were excellent. His musical ability was better than average. Somehow though, and I'm sure you've met people like this, he was able to appear as merely part of the background, even if he was standing at the front of a line. Mm -hmm. He was always just there, not noticeable, not important or particularly valuable. The frustration of that appearance, as you can imagine, was its complete misleadance, let's say. There was most definitely, there most definitely was value in him, and it did not go unnoticed by Lisa Memminger, the human child, so much cannier at times than the stupefyingly ponderous adult she saw it immediately. His manner, the quiet air around him. When he turned the light on in the small, callous washroom that night, Lisa observed the strangeness of her foster father's eyes. They were made of kindness and silver, like soft silver melting. Lisa, upon seeing those eyes, understood that Hans Hubermann... Alright, sorry friends. Oh, camera died on me, or battery died. Alright. Lisa... Upon seeing those eyes, understood that Hans Hubermann was worth a lot. Some facts about Rosa Hubermann. She was five feet, one inch tall, and wore her brownie gray strands of elastic hair in a bun. To supplement the Hubermann income, she did the washing and ironing for five of the wealthier households in Moiching. Her cooking was atrocious. She possessed the unique ability to aggravate almost anyone she ever met, but she did love Lisa Memminga. Her way of showing it just happened to be strange. It involved bashing her with wooden spoon, 
and words at various intervals. When Lisa finally had a bath, after two weeks of living on Himmel Street, Rosa gave her an enormous injury-inducing hug, nearly choking her. She said, Zamensch du dreckiges! It's about time! After a few months, they were no longer Mr. and Mrs. Hubermann. With a typical fistful of words, Rosa said, Now listen, Liesel. From now on, you call me, you call me Mama. She thought a moment. What did you call your real mother? Lisa answered quietly, Auch Mama, also Mama. Well, I'm Mama number two then. She looked over at her husband. And him over there? She seemed to collect the words in her hand, pat them together, and hurl them across the table. That Zaukerl, that filthy pig, you call him Papa. Verstehst? Understand? Yes, Lisa pr promptly agreed. Quick answers were appreciated in this household. Yes, Mama, Mama corrected her. Zaumensch, call me Mama when you talk to me. At that moment, Hans Hubermann had just completed rolling a cigarette, having licked the paper and joined it all up. He looked over at Lisa and winked. She would have no trouble calling him Papa. The Woman with the Iron Fist Those first few months were definitely the hardest. Every night, Lisa would nightmare. Her brother's face, staring at the floor. She would wake up swimming in her bed, screaming and drowning in the flood of sheets. On the other side of the room, the bed that was meant for her brother, floated boat-like in the darkness. Slowly, with the arrival of consciousness, it sank, seemingly into the floor. This vision didn't help matters, and it would usually be quite a while before the screaming stopped. Possibly the only good to come out of these nightmares was you check for breathing. The sound of the accordion was, in fact, also the announcement of safety, daylight. During the day, it was impossible to dream of her brother. She would miss him and frequently cry in the tiny washroom as quietly as possible, but she was still glad to be awake. On her first night with the Hubermanns, she had hidden her last link to him, the grave digger's handbook, under her mattress, and occasionally she would pull it out and hold it. Staring up the letters on the cover and touching the print, 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 print,
serpent inside, she had no I idea what any of it was saying. The point is, it didn't really matter what the book was about. It was what it meant that was more important. The book's meaning. One, the last time she saw her brother. Two, the last time she saw her mother. <clears throat> Hold on here, guys. Short little intermission. Okay. Oh, I forgot to continue it. All right, well, I suppose that's about 15 minutes there. Uh, so we will end here and continue next time um, in part three. And now that so many of you are enjoying these and want to see more of these. Um, I will definitely keep up on these a little better. Um, but yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, be sure to comment down below. Um, I don't know how you want me to read, uh, how much you want me to read. I mean, I'll probably just continue with the 15 minutes. I think those are good intervals. Um, but yeah, make sure to like, subscribe, um, again, comment, and um, I'll see you guys next time. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening. Cheers!